Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who greets us in this and every season, whose word never fails, whose promise is sure. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of our neighbors. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned, we have hurt our community, we have squandered your blessings, we have hoarded your bounty. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. Amen. God is a cup of cold water when we thirst. God offers boundless grace when we fail. Claim the gift of God's mercy. You are freed and forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, with all your faithful followers of every age, we praise you, the rock of our life. Be our strong foundation and form us into the body of your Son, that we may gladly minister to all the world through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading comes from Romans chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Here ends the reading.
gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the gospel of our Lord. Grace and peace to you, sisters and brothers in Christ. Let me tell you a little bit about our friends up the street or over in town, I suppose, at the Roman Catholic Church. While not every person in the pews believes everything professed by the wider church, I mean, that goes without saying, that is, after all, how it works in virtually every church, not every individual agrees with every stance the church takes, but here's the nominal Catholic stance. Jesus gave Peter some keys that gave him power over the church, earth, even heaven itself. The keys to the kingdom gave him the power to bind and to lose build up, and to destroy. When Peter's time drew to an end, he handed those keys over to a fellow named Linus, who held on to them for a while before passing them off to another man. And then that happened again, and again, and again, and again, until we now have Francis holding those keys. What I am describing is the papacy, a way in which one pope leads the church for a while, then another, then another, And the verses I just read from, from Matthew, are the basis, or at least the justification, for that practice. Now, in the 16th century, as part of the Lutheran Reformation, some reformers took note that one description of the Antichrist that we find in the New Testament epistles is a human who claims the authority which really only Christ has. We had a bit of a conflict. And that's the kind of thing people are going to butt heads over. Did Jesus give such authority to so many men across time and to some degree space? They weren't all in Rome. Or are they claiming to have an authority which they do not? Well, based on the name on our church sign, it seems that we nominally, though maybe not everyone in the pews agrees, We reject the idea of the keys giving the Pope that kind of authority. At least nowadays, we have a few decades under our belt, a few decades worth of ongoing dialogue between the Lutheran World Federation, of 
which the ELCA is a part, and the Roman Catholic Church. And we are on the cusp of agreeing to do certain kinds of ministry together on a global scale. But I've clearly gotten ahead of myself. Are we talking about Peter today? See, our Lutheran stance is those keys were not Peter's to hand off to anyone else. And if they're retained at all, they've been handed over to the church as a whole. The church is, after all, an expression of the kingdom of heaven on earth, the very thing which those keys are supposed to help Peter build up. So let's say we together have this authority. What does it even mean? Well, to bind or to loose were terms that some Jewish teachers would use, and they were used to describe morality, as in just what's okay to do and what's not okay to do. We might think of how Jesus taught in a way that was radically different, taught things that were radically different from some conventional teachings, and yet Jesus said he was not abolishing the law, but fulfilling it. In the same way, we might hear this as the opportunity to interpret and apply the law, even if the law itself has not changed. How can that be? Not unlike last week, comparing the unchanging nature of God to the ever-changing circumstances of our lives, we can acknowledge that the law may never change, it never goes away, and yet because the context in which we live can be so radically different, how the law gets applied in that context does change. Now that may ruffle some feathers. Many of us have this instinct that the way things were, maybe in biblical days, oh, usually it's the days in which we were raised, that things ought to stay the same as they were back then. And if that were the case, why would Jesus confer this authority on anyone to make any of these judgment calls? Yet another reaction against this idea might be to ask, what happens if Peter, or the Pope, or the church as a whole, decide to bind something which God would not bind and to loose something that which God would not loose. Is that not a violation of the unchanging law? Sounds like it. Perhaps it is. Though I have encountered at least one scholarly attitude towards this text that claims our English prepositions muddy the meaning. This is not that the authorities on earth have the ability to override the eternal authority of heaven, but rather that those eternal authorities would condone, maybe approve, of the earthly authorities in this age. In other words, whatever benefits the kingdom of heaven as represented in the church offers to the world, which by way of scripture, the preached word and the sacraments, would include forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life, the heavenly authorities will not withhold any such benefits, call them blessings if you want, will not withhold any such blessings from us, from the world, because we get it wrong, because we make the wrong judgment call. See, that bears repeating because it's the logical conclusion of the choice we in the Protestant arm of the church have made. This is not about one person or even one structure having the authority and passing it down. This is about the kind of authority that the church universal has on earth. The implication is when the church messes it up and violates some eternal law, the blessings afforded to its members by heaven are not withheld in the least. When you consider the grand scope of this universal church, with all its various traditions planted in and expressed in different cultures, you find a multitude of attitudes about these important questions, questions of binding and loosing. We don't all agree. What behaviors are acceptable? What behaviors will we regard as sin and yet still permit? What misdeeds can a person commit and still be welcome, but only if they confess, repent, and reform? What behaviors or misdeeds should never be welcome, no matter what happens? 
Each of those questions then gets its own follow-up question, but rather than being about just membership, who do we let in the door? And then it asks those questions again about our pastors specifically. So today in some church circles like ours, those debates are about, well, the same sort of debates that we see on the news and in our politics. Immigrants, both legal and illegal, LGBT folks, whether, how, and how much to welcome these groups adapt to their influence or insist they conform to the way we've always done things and so on. Those are the kind of debates we're having. And yet in other circles, there are debates that are still raging that seem settled in ours. What about women pastors? Can divorced people preach? And they even sit on church councils? Even questions like, can a person of another race properly preach and minister in a context where no one else looks like them? These are questions that not that long ago, most Americans would have answered no. So African Americans called by God to the ministry and then in turn denied access to seminary. They started their own seminaries and built their own churches. Women called by God to ministry and denied seminary, would often leave their church homes to instead build up the ministries of those churches that would have them. That is still happening today. So some look over the fence and they see we have, what, gay men who serve as pastors and preach in pulpits, and they are aghast. How can this be? Meanwhile, some of us look back over that same fence and see men who are known to abuse women and have molested children and yet get to keep their positions, their pulpits, their pensions, their keys. What's accepted over here is an anathema over there, and what's tolerated over there is career-ending at the least over here. Now, I, for one, would much rather be on this side of the fence if those were the choices, so here I stand. However, I must admit that I do not think heaven looks down and pays too much mind to that fence. Heaven sees us binding and loosing, struggling to know what is right, struggling to find that balance between, on the one hand, we must love our neighbors as God loves us, and that means unending mercy and forgiveness. And on the other hand, that we are called to holy living, repentance, and justice, and that means keeping people safe. Lord, have mercy on us because we are doing our best, and all of us will get it wrong at least sometimes. How can we who disagree so fervently, who by definition must be getting it wrong if others are getting it right, possibly share these keys? kingdom, this church. Well, look how Peter got the keys in the first place. Who do you say Jesus is? His response was the Messiah, the son of the living God, about the only one to figure it out while Jesus was still living. We are imperfect, fallen, sinful creatures who cannot get it right, but we know who the Messiah is, our deliverer, our redeemer, the Christ. We know he is the son of God, the one who with God, with God the Father, creates and judges the world. We do what we can to honor the call laid before us, knowing full well that we will fall short every step of the way. And our disagreements spring up and cause so much damage because in our imperfection, we cannot conceive of a perfect God and we cannot live perfect lives, and yet we dare to demand that others do. We're all grasping after the same God, who's the same Jesus, informed by the same scriptures. So it's not a stretch that we are holding the same keys, even if we disagree on how to use them. So who do you say Jesus is? What are you grasping after? When you bind or loose, build up or destroy, welcome in or cast out, for whose sake do you make those choices? God's? kingdom, the innocent among us, your own. In 
some sense those keys are now yours. You can bind and loose as you see fit. You can unlock the gate or slam it shut. And in this discernment, you're called to just do your best. It's all anyone can ask. For my part, those who would victimize the innocent cannot be permitted to do so. And therefore, we have to draw some boundaries. Beyond that, err on the side of grace, forgiveness, and acceptance. We need the gates open wide, wide enough to let sinners in, because let's face it, that's the only way we're getting in. When we get there, should we find something we have bound or loose is no longer permitted as such by heaven, then so be it. At least we'll be on the right side when we find out. Amen. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the 
life everlasting. Amen. Confident that God receives our joys and concerns, let us offer our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of creation. God of Sarah and Abraham, inspire your church to pursue righteousness in its ministry. Equip us to share your compassion that unites us as one family of faith. Lord, in your mercy. Remind us that from the beginning of creation, you knit together a world meant for harmony. Protect and restore the wasted places to joy and gladness. Lord, in your mercy. Stir the leaders of nations and towns, militaries and courts to respond to your teachings. Let your call for justice reach all people and bring deliverance where there is oppression. Pray especially for those working to bring about peace. John, Josh, Tyler, Jack, Matt, Nick, Dane, Claire, and Becca. Lord, in your mercy. Show your steadfast love and faithfulness to those in despair. Increase their strength. Care for all who feel low. Keep safe any in the midst of trouble. And protect vulnerable people from harm. We pray especially for Lisa, Connie, John, and Melody, Horst, Mabel, Anne, Peggy, John, Bobby, Sue, Penny, Carol, Charlene, Skip, Anne, Paul, Margaret, Tootie, Denny, Teresa, and Rich's friend, Steve. Lord, in your mercy. Encourage those who offer their gifts and talents and service to your church. Energize this congregation's rostered and lay leaders, musicians, teachers, readers, and administrators, so they may be transformed in sharing your grace. Lord, in your mercy. God of all the saints, death is overcome in Christ's resurrection. We rejoice with the faithful departed. Sustain us in hope until we come to, at last to our heavenly home. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray. In the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. As you share a greeting of peace, I will remind you once again that we are praying over all gifts given and received. God of field and forest, sea and sky, you are the giver of all good things. Sustain us with these gifts of your creation and multiply your graciousness in us that the world may be fed with your love through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The God who calls across the cosmos and speaks in the smallest seed, bless, keep, and sustain you now until the end of the age. Amen. Go in peace, share the harvest. Thanks be to God.